Hello and welcome to this demo. Today we're going to show you how to configure a stretched virtual SAN cluster. In this environment we have two main site, sites called Austin and Dallas and a third site that will function as a witness. In our main sites we have all flash Dell PowerEdge FX2 vSAN ready node servers powered by Samsung SSDs. Let's take a look at our cluster configuration first. We're going to click the host and cluster objects and then the manage tab. On the Manage tab, we'll be looking at the vSAN configuration. vSAN is configured in manual mode and currently has 8 hosts contributing storage for a total of roughly 16 terabytes worth of flash capacity. Next, we will look at DRS. DRS is configured in fully automated mode, which basically means that VMs can migrate to any hosts in the cluster. Now let's take a look at vSphere HA. Of course, HA is turned on as this allows us to have VMs automatically restarted when the failure has occurred. This could of course be a site failure, a host failure, or host isolation. Let's take a look at the HA configuration. But before we do, I want to point out that the host monitoring feature is the feature which is responsible for the exchange of heartbeats. When doing any type of na network maintenance, make sure to disable this functionality. Now let's have a look at the different types of failure conditions and VM responses. In our scenario, we have told HA to power off and restart virtual machines when a host isolation has occurred. Now note that this only applies to a host isolation and doesn't apply to a, for instance, site partition. VM component protection has been left disabled as this currently only applies to legacy storage systems. In order to ensure we have sufficient capacity available to fail over impacted virtual machines, we will leverage the mission control to set aside a certain amount of resources. We highly recommend to use the percentage-based mission control policy and set this to 50% for both memory and CPU. Any value lower than 50% can result in virtual machines not being restarted. We've also set a couple of advanced options. To ensure we have an isolation address in both sites, we've specified two additional isolation address using DES isolation address 0 and 1. And we've also disabled the default isolation address, which is normally the gateway. Both addresses that we specified should be site local. Now we're going to look at the VM host groups. We have host and VM groups predefined. The Dallas host group contains all hosts which are located in Dallas. And of course, the same applies to Austin. We've also pre-created VM groups for both Austin and Dallas. Each of these groups lists the virtual machines which should actively run from a compute perspective in that particular location. Note that vSAN leverages data locality to ensure reads are always served locally and do not need to cross the network. In order to guarantee this, we've created two rules, one for Dallas and one for Austin. Note that these are should rules as must rules are so-called hard rules and cannot be violated by vSphere HA. To ensure that when a single host failure occurs, HA respects the VM to host rules, we have defined this in the vSphere HA rule settings section. Now let's configure the fault domains. This is essentially the virtual sand stretch clustering functionality. As you can see, we currently have no fault domains configured, and now we're going to create a new fault domain or a stretch cluster. We're going to rename the standard names to reflect the name of the location. In our case, preferred becomes Austin and secondary becomes Dallas. Next we will select the four hosts that are part of the Dallas location and simply move them over by clicking the arrow to the right. That is all that it takes to define two locations within virtual SAN and as you can see it's really straightforward to create this stretch clustering configuration. Now after we've moved those hosts over to the right we're going to click next and we will be defining a witness host. Only thing we will need to do in this section is basically select a host that will become available as a witness host. Do mind that it needs to be outside of the cluster itself, but within the same data center, virtual data center that is. So we've selected the witness host, and now we're going to select the hosts, or we're going to select the disks, basically the flash device and the capacity device that are part of this host, so that at least it can be used for virtual SAN to store the witness components on. After we've selected all of the different components, we can click finish and the virtual SAN stretch clustering configuration will be created. So now that we created the stretch clustering configuration, we just need to wait a couple of seconds before it is reflected in the UI itself. Of course, we can speed up the process by simply clicking refresh and that's actually what we're going to do next. So we're going, going to click refresh and at that point in time, you can actually see these two new sites within the UI and you will see a third site, which basically is the witness. 
and here we go. So we have four hosts in Austin, four hosts in Dallas, and we have an external witness host being managed outside of the, uh, the cluster itself. Fairly straightforward, very easy to create as well, and very easy to maintain. So now we're going to look at one of the virtual machines. So because on the virtual machine level, we can see how the objects are distributed within the cluster itself. So we're going to click one of the virtual machines. We can actually see that the virtual machine is up and running. It has a storage policy called virtual send default storage policy, and it's actually compliant to this storage policy, which is important for the virtual machine's availability. So we're going to select one of the components or one of the objects, which in this case is the VM home directory, and we will see where the hosts, uh, where the virtual send cluster has actually placed the components of this object. In this situation, we'll see three different components as part of that single object. The first one being placed in Austin, the second one being placed in Dallas, and of course, there's the witness, which has been placed on the witness host. So now let's go back to the cluster and we're going to introduce a failure. In this scenario, what we did is we failed all four hosts in the Austin environment to actually see what would happen from a storage perspective, but also from a vSphere HA perspective. So we're going to refresh the, uh, the UI for a second. And then what you will see is that the, um, the hosts have actually failed. So they will show up as disconnected or uh, not responding. Some of the virtual machines are also showing up as not responding. And as you can see, they immediately they've been uh, restarted by vSphere HA. And in this case, the virtual machine that we just that just was up running, you can see that it's actually restarting. Uh, but the other thing that I need to point out is that currently it also states that the VM storage policy is non-compliant. And this is basically because half of the components have now gone missing. And of course, we can also see that in detail when we click the monitoring tab. So next, we're going to click the monitoring tab to look at the components or the objects in a bit more detail. So here we have the same VM home directory again. Again, on the right side, it says non-compliant. And when we start drilling down, we can actually see which part of this specific object is missing. So in a couple of seconds, you will see that we have an active witness. We have one active component, which happens to be in Dallas. But then there's also an app set component, which happened to reside in the uh, Austin data center. And that is the data center that has failed. When the site returns for duty, the changes will be replicated and the virtual machine will be compliant again. And that ends this demonstration for today. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Goodbye.